kidding. The mask was defeated and its soul was sealed away forever. You know, I thought I was finally done. I thought I was finally finished with the Splatterhouse franchise. I've reviewed and beat Splatterhouse 1, 2, and 3. And heck, I even looked over the 2010 game. But as it turns out, there is another. A game that was never released outside of Japan and only for the Nintendo Famicom. Splatterhouse Wanpaku Graffiti. Now I don't have a Famicom, but I did find a fan English translated version of the game online. So let's check it out. Now the title screen is in Japanese, but I assure you that this is it. Wanpaku Graffiti by Namcot. Namcot? Namco? What? Huh, apparently that's not a typo. Anyway, let's start. The game opens with a cutscene depicting a pink-haired girl crying at a gravesite before lightning strikes, bringing her loved one back to life. They don't get to celebrate for long, however, as the lightning returns to summon a spoopy pumpkin, which kidnaps the girl. I think it's safe to say that these are cutesy chibi versions of recurring characters Rick and Jennifer. This is quite an artistic change from the first game. Stage 1, this will be your grave, ha 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 ha. That doesn't really sound too threatening considering we just left a grave. So the game plays as a side-scrolling platformer beat-em-up, much like the first two Spider-House games, which is a good start. Your default weapon, however, is a machete instead of your punches and kicks. There's also no ducking, which makes sense since that would be overkill with how short Rick is here. Kind of like crouching with Odd Job and Goldeneye. The jumping feels good, but it is a little weird when you jump in place. There's no real momentum with the animation. I'm not sure how to explain it. It doesn't feel too bad, it's just unusual. This first level, you're just fighting your way out of the graveyard while encountering blue muck monsters, pink demon dogs, and flying tombstones. You know, the usual. Rick doesn't seem to have much range with his machete, but thankfully it strikes a bit farther than expected. As you kill enemies, you'll notice a fraction on the top of the screen. Whenever you get enough kills, you'll earn an extra hit point, but this requirement increases over time. You can fill your health up with various treats you find along the way. Candy heals you for one point, and a burger heals a whopping four points. Soon enough, you'll reach a mini boss fight, Dracula doing the thriller dance with some swamp things. Okay, this sets a real precedent for the rest of the game. Hopefully it doesn't disappoint. After he's finished moonwalking, you just have to fight a small wave of the monsters while the Count flings rocks into the air. Pretty simple stuff. After this, you enter a house that's laughing hysterically about something. Alright man, calm down. There's not too much going on in the first room, just dismembered hands and bamboo spikes. Don't forget to break the boxes for health before moving on. Next, you have to fight a shelf full of possessed books. Ah, now there is a splatter house I know and love. Only the right shelf though for some reason. The left bookshelf must be the nice one I guess. After that we fight the boss of the first stage. A girl, or perhaps a doll, who uses her severed head and chairs as weapons. The chairs can be annoying as they keep recovering after being destroyed, but the head is what you really want to focus on. This might be where your first death happens, which is fine since you'll get to start right at the boss fight, as long as you still have continues. I recommend you win, however, since defeating this boss awards you with the first level password. If you run out of continues, you just gotta type that password in and then you're on to stage 2. Speaking of, here's stage 2. Be garbage of cesspool. <laughs> Did I mention this was a fan translation? You're still in the same house, but this time there's blue spiders that spit rocks at you. I would have expected webs, but this works too, I guess. They're actually kind of a pain to fight too. Get past them and you'll make it to the kitchen. There's a lot of mini bosses. This time you fight two kitchen knives in an oven that spawns an endless amount of chickens. This reminds me of a boss fight from the first Splatter House, but at least in this one, Rick's not punching knives with his bare fists. After this, the ground gives way and you fall through several floors before landing in the sewers. I like that they let you control your fall during this, instead of just making it a normal cutscene. Here you gotta deal with pink mice and nasty sewer leeches. They seem kinda tricky to avoid at first, but I found the best method to be to keep moving forward, and jump attack the leeches as they spring up into the air. Interestingly, this was very similar to the strategy I used for the sewer enemies in the first game. The boss here is a giant green rat, and boy is this an annoying fight. Your goal here is to slice your way through the smaller rats and reach the big guy. 
But there's this wind constantly pushing you back. Why there's wind in a sewer, I have no idea. Anyway, every time one of the small enemies hits you, you're flung all the way back to the left, and then you have to start walking all over again. And they can be tricky to hit, especially as you get closer. I'd say that the rat boss was a little too unfair for a stage 2 boss, but he actually dies in one hit, so that does even things out. Oh, cheap final attacks that happen after the boss is dead. We meet again. Seriously, if I didn't just barely gain an extra health point after beating the boss, then I would have died from that. Yeah, this is Splatterhouse. Next we have stage 3, Welcome to Devil Town. That sounds like something a 5 year old made up for Halloween, but I guess that matches with the aesthetic of the game. This time, Rick's fighting his way through a suburban neighborhood, with his main enemies being pumpkins. Some that like to hop around, and some that enjoy spitting smaller pumpkins at you. Oh, there's also bugs, cause that's spooky too, I guess. I recommend stomping on every trash can you see, because many of them contain health items. Eventually, you'll reach a more bigger house. Not sure why Rick is even bothering going inside here, since he's just trying to save Jennifer, but okay. And here we get another Splatterhouse throwback with these chainsaw bosses. And then after that, something kinda different. It's the chest burster scene from Alien, except instead with an anime schoolgirl. And instead of one parasite, there's like a thousand of them. This fight is all about learning the parasite patterns. The ones that crawl on the ceiling fall down eventually and then fly across the screen quickly, but the ones that land immediately on the ground hop slowly to the side. Using this, you can figure out when it's time to jump and when it's better to attack. Hey, I won. Wait, wait, no. No, I see what you're gonna do here. There's one left, isn't there? Well, you're not gonna get me this time. Oh, there wasn't. And after all that, she's completely fine. Alright game, I see what you're doing. After that, you work your way farther down the street, fighting more pumpkins until you reach a church. These shadowy dudes holding candles totally aren't ominous or anything. This of course leads to the next mini-boss who, uh, looks kinda like a clan member. Oh, but don't worry, he's actually just a Satanist. First, he sends these pink elephants at you before activating his goat stand and going ram crazy. Since he recoils from each of your attacks, he's not too tough. You just gotta be careful and pay attention to his movements. Another street section, yada yada, and you come up to the final house and boss of the stage. Who is it this time? Oh. Oh no. Well, that turned out a lot less disturbing than it could've. So yeah, you just fight Jeff Goldblum- er, I mean, the giant fly. He drops smaller flies as projectiles, a pattern I'm starting to notice. And that's about it. He's a pretty easy fight. Hmm, I wonder if- oh man, it actually worked. What's gonna happen? Oh, it transported me to ancient Japan. Cool. Now I have to scale this building while fighting off giant mushrooms with eyes. Actually, I think they're umbrellas. Once you reach the top and enter, you have to deal with clumsy zombie maids that keep spilling tea, and this constant barrage of raining bamboo. Ancient Japan times are tough. Get past that and you make your way to this room for another boss- Oh wait, no. It's just a Japanese girl doing a dance for you. A really long dance. Don't worry, you can pass the time by pressing the A button to fart during this part. Yeah, I don't know who decided to program that in. After this, she gives you a crystal ball and then tells you to leave. Alright then. Next we have stage 4, Diamond Lake. Sounds very similar to another infamous lake, doesn't it? Your muck monster pals return again, this time with bats, spiky debris, and spooky ghosts. But on the bright side, you can find the shotgun, which really helps to keep the beasts at bay. There's something about this stage music that sounds really familiar, but I'm not sure where I know it from. Oh, and in the background... <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that's pretty funny. Near the end, you run into a gauntlet of sharks. The trick here is to just watch the background and avoid them as best as you can. The boss of this stage is a cloaked demon who attacks with a knife and fork. I guess he's hungry. I really love the sound effects here. It's satisfying as hell when you get a hit on him. It almost sounds like an Atari game or something. Next up is stage 5, Diamond Camp. Keeping up with the Jason theme, I guess. This level blows some hanged ghouls who heads and bodies attack you separately. 
There's something really funny about their running animation, like how they're just tiptoeing after you. After that, there's this stressful area where there's water rising in a room with spikes on the ceiling and hazardous debris floating by that you have to jump over, but it looks worse than it actually is. The next area makes up for that though with these screaming face enemies. I know they're based off that famous painting, but they kind of remind me of Junji Ito characters, or maybe the courtroom doll from the wall. The annoying part here is having to deal with the screams themselves. Yes, they actually use their own screams as attacks. Move over, Black Canary. If you make it through all that, there's just one more room before the boss on this stage. The Bucket Room. I call it that because the only obstacles here are falling buckets. But if a bucket does fall on you, it actually isn't that bad. Your character sprite changes and then you take half damage. It's actually secret bucket armor. Just in time too, because the next boss is a little boy who turns into a werewolf with telekinetic rock powers. He's pretty darn tough too, so the bucket armor is a must. Especially with the fact that your max health always gets reset to something lower every time you run out of continues and you're forced to use the stage code to keep going. Grab the bucket, be careful, and you should eventually win. Which leads to stage six, Hell House on the Hill. That's some scary alliteration right there. Before you can even get to the Hell House though, you have to cross this bridge. And man is this an annoying bridge. You're given a shotgun which you'd think would help, but it really doesn't. Sometimes enemies even seem to be set up in such a way that when you blast them defensively, your gunshot actually knocks you right into the pit. The worst part about this isn't that you die or lose health from falling off, but you have to redo the area all over again. They must have known this section was hard, cause it's basically the whole stage. There's a climbing part after with some pumpkins, but it's nothing really. Just get through them and you've made it to the hell house. No boss or anything. Guess the bridge was the boss. And just like the first splatter house, it seems like stage 7 is the last. The very first section isn't much, just a hallway with stuff you've seen before. But then you fall into a pit where a cultist grabs you and feeds you to a giant meatball. Then you wake up in a grave for the second time today, and move on to another chainsaw fight. After that there's a fiery fly room, odd choice. And then we have a room full of pits and pendulum. Oh, I get it. This one's actually a tricky platforming test since the clocks shoot lightning in inconvenient directions. There's no brute force in your way through this one, you just gotta get good. Alright folks, we're almost to the big boss now, just a few more rooms. Don't move too fast though or you might miss this secret. The right door here progresses you like normal, but if you enter the left door, you fight toilet monsters and a plunger. Why is this significant? Because you can keep re-entering this room to grind the easy enemies and increase your health points. It's actually really cool that they added this to counteract the fact that you lose a lot of health bar every time you run out of lives. In our final stretch to the boss, we have a fiery skull room, a bat room, and oh god, not these guys again. At least after all this, we get a nice waiting room, complete with the vending machine which refills your health. Alright, we're finally here. Big boss time. And it's... Oh yeah, the pumpkin from the beginning. I totally forgot about him. For a final boss, he's pretty simple. He floats around, occasionally dropping a shower of baby pumpkins, and then when you hit him, he bounces around the room for a while before repeating the cycle. That's pretty much it. But while the attack pattern is simple, man is it hard to avoid damage here. This is mainly due to the fact that you have virtually no invincibility frames when taking damage, so one mistake can stack up quickly. Believe me, this fight may not look that epic, but it's legitimately hard. I keep dying. It especially sucks when you have to restart the entire stage, but it's actually a good thing I did. Remember that part where the cultist feeds you to the meatball? Well as it turns out, that doesn't have to happen. If you maneuver yourself right as you fall into the room, you can avoid the cultists altogether and enter a secret door. This in turn takes you to Egypt. Okay, I didn't expect that. This pyramid is a pretty tough secret level, so it almost feels more like a punishment than a reward. But if you manage to make it to the end, you're met with yet another dancing girl who gives you yet another crystal. I have no idea what's going on here. Anyway, I've made it back up to that toilet room and this time I'm really gonna grind. I gotta make sure I got a hefty life bar to deal with Mr. Pumpkin. Ugh, gosh. The extra health helps, but this is still a hard fight. Just gotta be careful. Ah, oh, come on. Gotta make every move count. Get him. Get him. Yes! 
deal that final blow and you're treated to a satisfying and possibly seizure-inducing boss explosion, though most of it isn't picked up by my recording anyway. After that, Rick and Jennifer are finally reunited. And... what the heck? This was all just a movie? And who the hell is that? The director? He looks like the meatball from earlier. Oh, and he's speaking Japanese. What happened, translator? Well, whatever the case, I'm just glad to finally put this series to rest. It's nice to have a happy ending to- Oh, and that's not everything. Remember those two crystals I got earlier? Well, it turns out they're both super secret items which unlock extra ending scenes. One of Rick and Jennifer chilling on a hill together, and another which looks like the beginning of the first Splatter House, suggesting that this might be a prequel. Wait, so I found the secret levels and got the best ending by complete blind luck? Awesome. Thanks, Wampaku Graffiti. I feel great. And yes, winners don't use drugs. Unless they're like, prescription or something. Wow, what an ending. Wampaku Graffiti feels like a cuter, simpler, more forgiving version of the first Splatterhouse game, with a lot of callbacks to the original as well. That being said, it's still pretty challenging in its own right, and it still feels rewarding to beat. The game was full of a lot of neat classic horror references, and it had a lot of fun humor too. On top of that, and maybe most importantly, it played well. The game was fun to play. If this was really the last Splatterhouse game out there for me to review, then I think it was a good one to end on. Oh, completely forgot it was Halloween. I, I gotta get going, guys. So, um, happy Halloween. I hope you guys enjoyed the review. Have fun out there. Stay safe. Don't eat the big candy. <laughs> don't eat the bit, the candy. <laughs> you can eat candy, but don't eat the big razor blades. <laughs> you can eat the small. Look, sometimes there's can- guys, here's a PSA. Sometimes they poison the can- nobody does that. That- that hasn't happened ever in history. How could you even- if someone put a razor blade in a candy, you would see that there's a big razor blade shaped hole inside of the candy, so... Who thought of this? Oh, hey Floyd. Hi. Floyd says Happy Halloween.